The Lich King is one of the most powerful enemies in World of Warcraft, with him being one of the only ones that actually gives us a run for our money, rather than just being a joke of a character with us slicing through him like butter just so we can get our weekly loot. But is it possible that the Lich King could have even been stronger had Arthas not been the one to fall prey towards becoming the Lich King? Forget the lore as we know it, and just imagine for a moment that anything was possible. All the characters that were intertwined in Arthas' life during the era of Warcraft 3 suddenly became viable candidates towards becoming a potential Lich King. If Ner'zhul chose someone else to become his champion, and if he merged atop the Frozen Throne with someone else other than Arthas in Warcraft 3, someone who did not have to rely so heavily in the light prior to taking up Frostmourne, could the Lich King have been even stronger than Arthas as we saw him in Warcraft 3 and Wrath of the Lich King. It's quite possible. Arthas makes for an incredibly strong character to be manipulated by Ner'zhul. His passion towards saving his people ultimately turned out to be his undoing, allowing him to play into Ner'zhul's hands. However, the fact that Arthas is a paladin means that when he transitioned from a warrior wielding the light to a death knight, a warrior who wields death, he ultimately sacrifices his holy powers to further his skill in another magical art, thereby forsaking his connection with the light. Since the two are complete opposites of one another, it appears that when one is risen into undeath or becomes a necromancer or death knight, they forsake the powers of the light if they had it prior in life completely in order to further their powers in necromancy or at least from what we have seen in the events of Warcraft 3 and in the events of the Arthas novel. In game, Things begin to shift a little, and some boundaries between schools of magic are a bit iffy, especially with the new information that we now know of regarding the light and the void. But back then, the boundaries between light and dark were distinct. Both powers contradicted each other. However, even though they contradicted each other, doesn't mean that they completely nullified one another. For example, one of the four original horsemen of Nax Ramis, Sir Zeliac, was so strong with his connection with the light that even as a death knight, the light still heeded his call. Again, in-game, the boundaries between light and dark are very blurred. There's some things that are not well explained, but in the novels, the line is clearly drawn. The light is fueled through just and moral actions. It envelops its user and fuels he or she with vindictive or healing powers if she or he that is wielding the light is a just character or is worthy of being redeemed. For example, when Arthas shattered Frostmourne's icy bonds, the ice which flung from holding the sword in place impales Muradin. After seeing this, Arthas begins tearing up and he begs the light to forgive him and to grant him a blessing to heal Muradin. And the light actually hears him and begins answering his call. But just as the light is about to fully envelop him, Frostmourne begins to whisper to Arthas, catching his attention and making him completely forget about and abandon Muradin, causing the light which answered his prayers to also abandon him. Another example is when Arthas marched into Stratholm and began purging the entire city, killing off all of the residents before they could be turned into undead, which honestly, I think is the right choice for that time. It's better to kill them off before they become undead and before the Scourge could begin bolstering the defenses within the city, ultimately allowing the Scourge to establish a secure foothold so close to the human kingdoms. However, the light it doesn't operate that way. A paladin of the light should always look for the best, even in the darkest of times, and in the most grim of scenarios. And for Arthas at that point in time, doing what he did, it pretty much meant that he completely lost faith in the light. That is why when he killed the citizens in Stratholm with his hammer, it refused to glow. The aura of the light vanished from his weapon, whereas before, it would always radiate brightly each time he engaged an enemy in combat. Now to follow up with this, Arthas nonetheless as we have seen him when he was a death knight was a nearly unstoppable force. His power multiplied after taking up Frostmourne and he was easily able to pretty much stomp in anyone's teeth that he came across. However, imagine if someone else fell into Arthas' shoes and was manipulated into becoming the Lich King. Someone who did not need to call upon the light to aid him in battle. Varian. Varian was a warrior to the core, even as a child. Growing up, he and Arthas would often spar with each other as children to their teenage years, and every time, Varian would pretty much smoke him in every sparring session. He was legendary with the sword, so much so that his ferocity and skill even gained him the favor of Goldrin. Not only this, but even the denizens of the Horde referred to him as Logosh. Imagine if Varian, someone so proficient with melee combat, could become the Lich King. Not only would his skills be enhanced, but he would never have to sacrifice a portion of his power like Arthas did with the light. Instead, he'd just become more powerful, and on top of that, he'd now possess necromantic abilities. 
One of the reasons that made Arthas so dangerous in combat was that he was trained in both the ways of a warrior and a paladin. Now you may think that a paladin is basically just a warrior who wields the light, so what's the difference? And you would pretty much be right. However, what I mean is that Arthas had two mentors, Uther, who taught him everything by the book, who established the basic foundations of his fighting skills as well as strengthening his connection with the light, and also Muradin, who honed his melee skills and taught him tricks that even ended up saving his life, one of which is a kick that he uses on Kael'thas during their battle on Ice Crown, which allows him to avoid a deadly blow. However, when Arthas became a Death Knight, his connection to the light was severed, and the only thing that carried over from his training was his skill in melee combat, which he learned from Uther and Muradin. Think about how powerful Varian would be as the Lich King. If he managed to always be a step above Arthas in melee combat and Arthas was already an exceptional fighter, just think about how devastating Varian would be with Frostmourne. Another person that could also give Arthas a run for his money is Kael'thas. When Arthas was a Paladin of the Light, Kael'thas pretty much dwarfed Arthas on the power scale. At one point, they almost got into a fight involving Jaina, but Arthas thought to himself, that had Kael'thas chose to attack him right then and there, that Arthas would have been dead. Kael'thas uses both arcane and fell magic in addition to other schools of magic, and fell magic by itself is already referred to as chaotic energy and also as death magic. We see dreadlords who are demons practice necromancy all the time. Also, let's not forget the fact that Kil'jaeden and the Legion created the Lich King himself, so in no way would it be impossible for the Lich King and undead to practice fell magic in addition to necromancy. Arcane magic could also be used if he so chooses. Now, arcane users are pretty limited to how much magic that they can use if the source of their magic were to be cut off. In the War of the Ancients, the Moonguard and Illidan were cut off from the Well of Eternity, and so their magical abilities weakened tremendously or took a great deal of strength and concentration just to conjure one simple spell. Ronin, who was a damn skilled sorcerer and who had been used to conjuring magical abilities without the reliance of the Well of Eternity, sees them having trouble and begins helping Illidan and the Moonguard with their spell work, showing them how to still be adept sorcerers while not being 100% dependent on the Well to conjure arcane spells. However, Kael'thas, though having to deal with the corruption of the Sunwell due to Arthas' actions, still is able to harness his magical abilities, and like Ronin, he is definitely a proficient sorcerer, a strong feat that he definitely has over Arthas. Again, he isn't sacrificing any power to become the Lich King, he's literally just adding more skills and sources of magic to the table. The only downside, however, is that his melee skills aren't as good as Arthas's. It's pretty up there, don't get me wrong. He was even able to stand his ground in a fight involving melee combat against Arthas for a bit while Arthas Arthas was a death knight, which is pretty damned impressive, and any weaknesses he may have in melee combat will be greatly overcompensated for with his skills in the magical arts. Illidan would also make for an incredibly strong Lich King, what with his thousands of years of combat experience, proficient melee skills, and vast knowledge of both arcane and fell sorcery, as well as his passion for protecting Azeroth, similar to Arthas' passion to protecting his own people, Illidan would make for a devastating Lich King. Not to mention that his mindset in some ways aligns with Ner'zhul, being that they both wanted the destruction of the Legion, although for different reasons. One for revenge, and the other to protect Azeroth. Who knows, perhaps Perhaps Illidan might be so powerful as to even partially resist Ner'zhul's will. And when it comes to comparing Illidan to Arthas as being the Lich King, I think he'll be on the same boat as Kael'thas, extremely proficient spellcaster, but in a straight up melee duel, I think that he'd perform better than Kael, but it's difficult to say whether or not he is on Arthas' level. Several times, Illidan and Arthas have clashed. The first time, it was a straight up stalemate, and the second time, Arthas ended up defeating him. Now, there's a lot of variables in the second time that they fought that may make an analysis of who was objectively the better duelist a bit difficult to discern, some of which being Ner'zhul's strength was fading, yet Arthas managed to defeat Illidan despite being already weakened. However, others also point out the fact that they were right on the doorstep of the Frozen Throne, and Ner'zhul was channeling every last bit of power he had into Arthas, which thereby allowed him to overpower Illidan. You can go back and forth. The last person I'm going to mention is Jaina. Jaina would make for a very dangerous Lich Queen, however, I'm not sure if she'd be on the same level as Arthas. She's dangerous in a different way, with her magical arts being the main weapon in her arsenal. However, without the melee skills needed to wield Frostmourne, which is pretty essential for the Lich King slash Queen, I don't think she'd make for a possible candidate to take up the role of Lich Queen in Ner'zhul's book. However, her skills in necromancy and frost magic would be pretty horrifying, especially since her knowledge of frost magic is already well honed. By becoming the Lich King, her powers of frost magic will only be amplified even more so, perhaps even leading 
leagues above that of Arthas' Lich King. However, a major setback is that she would barely have any melee skills, which would definitely be a huge hindrance. It's hard to imagine the Lich Queen being a full caster. Who knows, maybe she would be deadlier, as it would be harder to actually get to her, as she would utilize her arsenal of frost and necromantic magic to keep us out of reach while also hiding behind hordes of minions, or maybe it may lead to her actually being more vulnerable and weaker, as she would not be able to defend from melee attacks as effectively should someone be able to slip through her defenses. A fun fact by the way guys, when the Nightmare nearly consumed Azeroth due to the acts of Fandral Staghelm and Xavius in the novel Storm Rage, Jaina succumbed to the Nightmare and in her version of the Nightmare, she basically took up the mantle of the Lich Queen in order to prevent Arthas from falling into that path of damnation. It's pretty cool. But anyways, that's it guys. One of the most dangerous enemies in Warcraft history only to possibly be much stronger had others took up the mantle if Arthas had not. Now of course there are many other characters with unique talents, skills, and feats that may make for a devastating Lich King, but for the sake of not naming a quarter of the characters in WoW and keeping this video reasonable, I decided to only mention characters that were actually intertwined with Arthas' life and his downfall, primarily revolving around the events of Warcraft 3. Tell me what you guys think below. Who would you like to see as a Lich King or Lich Queen? And how and in what ways would they rival Arthas or be even more powerful than him? Thanks so much for watching this video guys, be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell for more videos like this in the future and until next time, I will see you all later.